it's it's multiple aspects. So Buy America, he he's talking about the administration is talking about making a four hundred billion dollar procurement investment. So that's kind of focusing on clean energy, infrastructure planning, and it's gonna you know power the new demand of you know the the American products and materials and services that they want to. The second piece is they want to make it in America, right? Retool and um, empower the American manufacturers, and part of that is also the wage gap too. Um, the third, the, another piece that I think is important that's in, in the rhetoric is innovate in America. So that's important because you've got to also build out the next 50 years as uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen was talking about, make a new, you know, they're going to make a new $300 billion um, investment in research and development and breakthrough technologies. So, so that why that's important is to continue to stay with the global trends. Um, and finally, one of the last pieces is, you know, investing in all of America. So ensuring that their government is uh, ensuring investments reaching all of America that's drawing talents and potential communities and government uh, spending is also um, more inclusive. Now it's interesting because you know this this is an ad administration that's coming in with its own catchphrase. Obviously, a lot of catchphrases from the last administration, including "America First." How does Biden's strategy differ from the former administration's "America First" strategy when it comes to manufacturing? Well, to, I think there's a couple of things. I think one that there needs to be a transparency and numbers on how many foreign deals that you're doing. And obviously, I think with the Trump administration, it wasn't actually completely all U.S. Centric, and I think that gets mixed up in, in the conversation. I think for with Biden, I think it's a different approach. Meaning, we're in, you know, COVID has hit over a year. I think more people are more open globally to ensuring the U.S. economy is strong. And how do you partner? Right? I think it's the rhetoric too, and the policies as well that you really do have to address the minimum wage. You do have to address, you know, what's that tax credit and the trade strategy to you know to, in order to do that. And I think that's where the partnerships with with what Biden has to do. And I don't think Biden is also saying, hey, we're, we're going to ignore our trade partners. I think that's also the rhetoric that I don't under, I don't hear that from the Biden administration. It's, you know, how do we strategically partner so that there is an ability to uh, uplift the U.S. economy, but also for the future, ensure that it is still there. So what does this mean then for existing trade deals from the former administration when it comes to manufacturing? Obviously, uh, Foxconn, the... Um, the building there comes to mind in the U.S. What are your thoughts on that? I think there's an opportunity, actually. So if you're, um, you know, outside the, you know, other countries that partner with the U.S. and if their strength is, buy, could could potentially buy U.S. products, U.S. goods, um, and then there's ability to create a, a, a trade around that, I think you get some favorable terms um, going forward and creating a strength. So that's what I would see as a trade strategy if I was a head of another country. You know, could you be advantage and, and help the U.S. in certain ways that you would get benefit in the long run? Because I think the U.S. is looking for short-term deals that they would need to do right now that I think they would trade off for some long-term partner benefits. And, I, and again, I think that's the, the different perspective that's coming in right now. Now, I also, also look at things that are coming up with manufacturing, for example, manufacturing PPE and some of the medical supplies to support that as we are in this sort of this panic situation with COVID. How do you see that playing out? I think it's not going anywhere. I, I, I think you look at the manufacturing industry as additive manufacturing, 3D printing, a lot of different companies um, had really did that shift in their agility to do that, their ability to really, you know, build that, you know, worker range, I think is so important. And that's why the, the movement of these companies, um, it's just not manufacturing, it's different uh, industries that are getting involved. So I think it as the supply chain has been more diversified and more nimble than ever before. And I want to talk about overall U.S. manufacturing ramping up. So is there sufficient demand to meet the supply that they would start cranking out? And, and where would that potentially be coming from? Yeah, that, that's a great question because right now in the U.S. we are in you know the COVID protocols and not back to full force. So I, you know it, I, I think it goes hand in hand when you're building the economy and being back at full employment. So I think, like you said, is a supply and demand question. Um, I believe you know you, if you look at what Asia has done, specifically China and other places where they have had that ramp up time and they're at almost full capacity. I would assume and assure that, that the U.S. will be on that as long as they stay on track with the vaccines and ability to get everyone back open to work. So that, I think, is tied to that. And it certainly helps that China is pushing its dual circulation strategy where it's developing at home and boosting cons um, domestic consumption as well. 
Anything we should be looking at on the horizon when it comes to U.S. domestic consumption, if we do have more goods getting cranked out? Yeah, I think the domestic consumption is, I think, I mean, specifically food items, actually, just to look at that specific. And also we looked at auto chip chip makers and, and that aspect has been the sh shortages as well. I think those two areas are really important to watch and how, you know, the agreements move forward on.